Hello brethren, Brother Wade here. As promised, we're going to do uh, Joel chapter 3 today. Uh, not too long ago, I did Joel chapter 2. Check that out please, before you watch this one, Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 2, as you know, is primarily concerning phase 1 of the day of the Lord, which one of its titles is, Wrath of the Face of Him Who Sits on the Throne. Father is dealing primarily with Israel, judging Israel first. Egypt also gets judged a lot. Egypt gets hit hard, phase one and phase two of the day of the Lord. Phase two of the day of the Lord, starting really after the seventh bowl is poured by the seventh angel when Jesus appears, and then he starts sitting to judge the living and the dead. He judges the nations that have gathered before him. And that uh, one of the titles for phase two of the day of the Lord is uh, Wrath uh, uh, of the Lamb, His Indignation. So, Joel 2, we focused on phase one of the day of the Lord, Israel getting judged, right, with six trumpet judgments. Now, the seventh trumpet judgment, uh, Israel's still under siege, awaiting for their deliverer to show up on the last day after the seventh bowl is poured. But Father multitasked during the seventh trumpet period, and he's primarily focused on beginning the breaking of the beast kingdom, uprooting it with the bowls of wrath. Father, we're going to see Father also calling for the, the, uh, my assembly of kingdoms of Zephaniah 3.8. You're going to see it right here in Joel 3. How cool is that? And part of the calling of the nations to assemble these great strong nations, right? Who think, some of them think they're coming to put the, take, take Jerusalem, put the finishing blow on the nation of Israel and take over Jerusalem. But they, Father Yahweh's got other things in store for them. And uh, uh, the appearing of Jesus Christ is not going to go well for them. But part of the uh, assembly of nations is what Father calls my mighty ones of Isaiah 13, 3. You see them here coming as well in Joel 3. If America is still alive, America's military, which hopefully it is, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll be part of that my mighty ones. But don't confuse that with Father claiming the Antichrist army during phase one in Joel 2. We saw that. So open up your hopefully New King James Version Bible. And let's start with verse 1 of Joel 3. For behold, in those days and at that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered amongst the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people have given a boy his payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Isn't it interesting how Father says that these nations are going to do this, but we also know that Father is orchestrating all of this. He doesn't cause wicked, uh, he doesn't cause people to be wicked, right? He doesn't cause people to want to be against, be, uh, to be an enemy or adversary of Yahweh and His Son, Lord God Jesus. But He sure does lure them to uh, the nation of Israel to be judged at the time of the end. Right? He sets that hook in the jaw, and He makes it so tempting for those who are His enemies and adversaries, they'll no longer put it off. Right? So they passed through Judah during phase one, but now we're in phase two, and it's time for uh, the beast kingdom to bring all of their armies. Uh, and you may say, well, didn't all their armies attack during phase one of the day of the Lord? Well, most of them did, but now we're having nations even farther away than Israel's surrounding nations we're having China and all of Pakistan and India, India and uh, 
um, all the different jihadist groups, you name it. And they're all coming back, and they're bringing more. And everyone's going to be there for this showdown, for this judgment. And they will return again, even after they pass through the first time, to collect up all the precious things from Egypt and Israel, especially in the Eastern Med, taking over the gas refineries uh, and the gas fields like Z Field Zor off the coast of Cairo, Field Leviathan, Field Tamar off the coast of Israel. You have uh, uh, gas fields off the coast of Lebanon. But so, this uh, gathering all nations, this is the sixth bowl gathering to Armageddon. And you might say, well, it doesn't say Armageddon here, it says Jehoshaphat, which is near the mountain, Mount uh, Zion at Jerusalem. Well, so you can't pack them all into the Valley of Jehoshaphat. So some will, many will be gathered and staged in both sides of the Valley of Armageddon. But don't forget, uh, there are ten dormant volcanoes on the eastern side of the Valley of Armageddon in the Golan, Golan Heights region. There's actually a volcanic park. Check it out. When you have the worst earthquake of all time of Revelation uh, 16, hope I didn't say 6 earlier in reference to uh, the gathering of the nations. It's Revelation 16, right? Sixth bowl. But Revelation 16, seventh bowl, we have the worst earthquake of all time that Isaiah 24 is talking about. And uh, I wonder if those ten dormant volcanoes are going to form a lake of fire and brimstone uh, so that all with the mark of the beast can be picked up by the angels uh, controlled by Jesus. Those are armies of heaven, which even the, uh, uh, the church that's transfigured will be part of. But um, yes, this is the gathering of the nations at the sixth bowl, which is also Zephaniah 3.8's my assembly of kingdoms. But some will be in Armageddon, some will be surrounding Jerusalem, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel. Is Israel Jesus' inheritance? Yes, that's why Zechariah 13, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 8 says at the first, uh, at phase one of the day of the Lord, when it's time to judge Israel first before the nations are judged, Father says he's going to strike the inheritance. He's going to strike the land of my companion, my shepherd, right? Capital M, the Lord of hosts. Capital S, capital C, and it's also in Isaiah 7 and 8, it's O Emmanuel. Right? So Father's going to use Gog of Magog and his hired razor flying to be armies to strike uh, Yisrael during phase one of the day of the Lord. But here we are at phase two of the day of the Lord in Joel 3. Um, you can see Israel going into captivity there in Joel 3.3. 3. Uh, that's what Zechariah 13 talks about and so many other passages. Two-thirds of Israel is going to die during phase one of the day of the Lord, and one-third is going to go into captivity, uh, not counting uh, the 10% holy stump that shall remain in hiding throughout the land. That's Isaiah 6. We'll get, that, get to that in a second when we get down to Joel 3.6. Joe 4, indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of, Phil of Philistia? This is the me, is the Lord of hosts, Yahweh. Uh, and Tyre and Sidon, Sidon, Lebanon, represent Hezbollah. And the coast of Philistia, Gaza, represents Hamas. So Hezbollah and Hamas in the last days are going to play a big part in... Um, uh, Gog's army. And, and that kind of gives you an idea right here, gives you a good idea of what the primary makeup is of Gog's army that attacks during phase one of the day of the Lord. But here's going, here we are in phase two of the day of the Lord, Joel 3, 
And the Lord of hosts, the me, capital M, is getting ready to render, use his son to render judgment and break that rod of anger. Right? Gog will serve as Yahweh's, whether he realizes it or not, as Yahweh's rod of anger, small r. That's Isaiah 10.5. This Assyrian Antichrist will be the sword of the curse of the song of Moses. Verse 4, indeed, what have you to do with me? We just read that. Uh, but if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your own head. That, when does that happen? When Jesus appears, hallelujah, in glory. And he comes like a thief. He comes quickly to render his judgment. Now the Lord is going to use uh, his severe sword, which is Jesus leading the armies of heaven, which the church is now a part of, along with the angels. But also there are mortals, right? The my mighty ones of Isaiah 13, 3. And we see him here in Joel 3 mentioned as well. From the far north, those who rejoice at his exaltation, Yahweh, the God of Israel. Right? Here they come out of the north. Hopefully America is part of that group. All right. But yeah, swiftly and speedily, it's Jesus' turn to come suddenly, right? Gog, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, Gog comes suddenly, right? The day of the Lord comes suddenly, and Gog's army is the sword portion of the overall curse called the uh, curse of the Song of Moses, right? Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy 32, that promised curse. Here it comes in phase one. But now we're in phase two. So, Father's saying, I'm, basically, I'm going to bring this judgment on you. It's now time. It's time to end the age. You've uh, had your fun. You've identified who you are. You've most of you have taken the mark of the beast. And uh, we all now know who's who. And it's time for judgment. Bring my son and let him sit and judge the nations. Verse 5, because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my prized possessions, this is what's future, this is what's going to happen during phase 1 of the day of the Lord, which you also see it happening to Egypt too during the pass-through of Judah in Daniel 11, verses 40 through 45. Verse 6, here we go, also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks, that you may remove them far from their borders. Remove them far from your borders. Verse 6 of Joel 3. Remove is the key word. This is obviously Zechariah 13, 7 through 9. But I want to take you to Isaiah 6. I hope no one listening thinks Isaiah 6 is just past history. Because Isaiah 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all of it concerns the primary fulfillment of prophecy at the end of the age. Did you know that? Turn to Isaiah 6, verse 12. You're going to find the match to verse 6 here in Joel 3. Isaiah 6, verse 12. I've got to pick up the pace or my Sony battery, <clears throat> or I should say my Sony, will overheat and turn off. Verse 6. <clears throat> uh, Isaiah 6, verse 12. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. Watch, wait for the word remove. The houses are without a man, and the land is utterly desolate. Right? There's Part of those determined desolations in the last days mentioned in Daniel 9. The Lord has removed, key word, men far away. Talking about from the land of Israel. But yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down so the holy seed shall be its stump. So 10% of Israel will hide well enough. And you might say, is, you might ask, is, uh, what about the uh, 
uh, the Christians who find themselves in Jerusalem and Judah at the fifth seal abomination of desolation who immediately go into hiding for 42 months. Are they part of that group of 10% holy seed that uh, hides well enough? And the answer is yes. They will not be found and taken captive with uh, one-third of Israel. So 10% is hidden well enough. That leaves 90%. And Zechariah 13, sadly enough, tells us that two-thirds of that 90%, which is 60% of current-day Israel, will die either due to sword, famine, pestilence, wild beast, you name it. They'll be gone. And uh, one-third will be taken into captivity, and Jesus will rescue them and deliver them as their deliverer, as their Savior, and will be on the clouds following Jesus into battle, the beast cities, uh, when he, in at that, that time uh, of Joel 3, uh, starts saving the remnant of Israel. But isn't it interesting that Joel 3, 6 is really talking about the 10% holy seed and that one-third of Israel that shall be removed from the land. Okay, Isaiah 6, Joel 3, 6. I thought you might find that interesting going back to Joel 3. All right. We left off at verse 7. Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your retaliation upon your own head. We know from Jeremiah 51 and Isaiah 41 and Micah uh, 5, I believe. It's either Micah 4 or Micah 5. It might be Micah 4. Um, the Lord is going to use the remnant to help along with the My Mighty Ones from the north, along with the armies of heaven, which we will be a part of, led by Jesus. Father's going to use all of them to include uh, the remnant as He frees them. They'll be handed weapons by the My Mighty Ones. I'm making a little speculation there, but Father's word will come true. right? They'll be given planes, kind of like what you see going on with Ukraine. They'll be given tanks. They're going to be involved in finishing the beast kingdom. They'll play a part. Verse 8, I will sell, this is the Lord talking, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah. Right, during phase 2, after Jesus comes. Right? And Father's using his severe sword, which encompasses all those assets to, do, to help uproot the beast kingdom and all of its cities. And the headquarters will be in Baghdad, land of Shinar, land of Shishak, land of the Chaldeans. Okay? That's Baghdad. Right? And the big sea is not only all of the rivers, like Euphrates rivers and Tigris rivers, but the main sea there. That for Babylon, the great city, is the Persian Gulf. Um, I will sell them to the Sabaeans. First of all, who is the Lord selling to Judah? And then after Judah has enough to possess and to help clean up and, and that sort of thing, uh, some of the remnant of the nations that were mentioned in this chapter. Who was mentioned in this chapter a few verses ago? Hezbollah, Hamas. Uh, now only the unmarked can be sold because the marked are going to be picked up by angels and dropped in the lake of fire. So now we're mainly talking about youth. We're talking about um, uh, some of the women, maybe some of the elderly. Okay, They're going to be taken into captivity. It's part of Yahweh's judgment on them. And you might say, after Jesus comes back, Jesus is going to allow that to happen? Absolutely. I'm not saying that. It's in the Word of God. Okay, and many other passages concerning the day of the Lord speak of that. But after a certain amount of time, I don't know how many years, the people who are being possessed by the people of Judah will be glad that they got possessed and, 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 and caused to become a slave, a possession, because it'll end up being a blessing for them and their offspring over the years. 
right? And even Assyria and Egypt will feel so blessed that they're kind of become part of the nation of Israel during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But uh, what does it mean into the hand of the people of Judah and they will sell them, right? Judah will sell the excess to uh, sell. Think about that. To the Sabaeans. That's Yemen. Isn't that interesting? Um, to a people far off, for the Lord has spoken. Isn't it interesting that you see right there in verse 8 that the distance from Jerusalem to Yemen, right, bypassing Mecca and Medina all the way down to Yemen is considered a people far off. Keep that in the back of your mind when you're reading other Bible prophecies concerning the last days. Coastlands afar off and that sort of thing like Isaiah 66. So as far as the Lord is concerned, it's, it's a far distance from Jerusalem all the way to Yemen. So when you're reading about other distances in regards to last days Bible prophecies, far off doesn't always mean the Arctic or Beijing, or Ontario, right? Far off could be as simply uh, is the other end of the Middle East. All right. Verse 9, Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Does that have anything to do with Revelation 14's proclamations? It sure does. In fact, these proclamations go out at the same time. This is the call for my mighty ones. All right. This is the, the proclamations of Revelation 14, those three angels. And this proclamation here, which is Isaiah 13, 3's proclamation, right? That call for my mighty ones out of the north, which is also, uh, you, you can say the three spirit of the three the spirit that, which are like three frogs of Revelation 16, that's Father's way of sending them out to encourage, to call for the wicked uh, leadership and generals and military from around the world to come as well. So this, my assembly of kingdoms, Father's calling for the ones that rejoice in His exaltation, mighty military powers called the my mighty ones, and you also see them here in Joel 3, and uh, at that seventh trumpet event, you're also going to, uh, shortly after that, within days after that, you'll see the spirits going out to bring the wicked as well. Father's orchestrating this because he's getting ready to send his son Jesus so he can sit and judge the nations. Earthquake here, fire over here, hailstorm here, 100 pounds, hailstones, uh, um, whirlwinds from the south, uh, the breath of Jesus, all kinds of things, not to mention the ten kings who turn against the beast in Revelation 17, which may or may not be the my mighty ones who now rejoice at Yahweh's exaltation. So what's the seventh trumpet event that begins all the calls and proclamations? Well, it's uh, given to us in Revelation 11. The two witnesses get killed. Their bodies lay in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. Boom! The Spirit of God comes into them and they stand up on their feet and their enemies see them slowly uh, ascend up into heaven. Right? Now Father pulls uh, Satan's ability to give his power to the Antichrist and false prophet. Father reaches, listen, reaches his verdict of Daniel 7.22 and now says, finally, it's, I've seen enough, right? I now award the kingdom to the saints of the Most High God himself, Yahweh. But the saints, right? The righteous, the ones who refuse the mark of the Antichrist, and that includes Christians too, who went through the Great Tribulation and that test of Revelation 3.10, and... Uh, Father's seen enough. It's time to award the kingdoms to the saints. But it takes within 45 day window after that before Jesus is here fighting the battle of the great day of God Almighty. 
Verse 10, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all ye nations. That is Zephaniah 3.8. Write it in your Bibles. Assemble and come, all ye nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Right? That's Isaiah 13.3. Not the my sanctified ones. Those are the transfigured ones. But the my mighty ones who rejoice at... Yahweh's exaltation is what's mentioned there. Your mighty ones. Don't confuse that with the Gog's army that Father temporarily calls his army in Joel 2. Right? The rod of anger of Isaiah 10.5. This is his severe sword of Isaiah 27, led by the appointed general of Jeremiah 51.27 who is the one who makes desolate of Daniel 9, 27 C. I know I'm throwing a lot out at you. Hallelujah. But go back and look up all those scriptures. That appointed general, Jeremiah 51, 27. He's also called the spoiler. In Isaiah 16, 4, he's also called that flying, uh, fiery flying serpent. In uh, Isaiah 14, towards the end of that. He is a Cyrus-like instrument of the last days. Let's better pick up the pace. Verse 12. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Who's going to sit to judge all the surrounding nations? Yahweh. Who's going to sit to judge all the surrounding nations? Jesus Christ. How can it both be true? Unless Jesus Christ in a in a bodily form is Yahweh God the Father God the Son God the Spirit when God the Father wants to be seen as a human be it corruptible or incorruptible it's Jesus hallelujah I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations right Isaiah 2 Revelation 16, put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Revelation 14, come, go down for the winepress is full. The vats overflow with, for their wickedness is great. Revelation 14, 15, Jeremiah 51, 33, Revelation 19. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. When does the day of the Lord start? Six seal. When does phase two of the day of the Lord start? Eh, It's hard to say whether it's seventh trumpet or seventh bowl. I would say phase two starts at the seventh trumpet, even though Jerusalem is still under siege. But Jesus doesn't come for a few weeks after that. Hallelujah. We know that from the 45 day window given to us in Daniel chapter 12. Uh, this, This is real important. Hang on, camera, don't shut down yet. Verse 15, the sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people. We see that in Zechariah 14. And a strength and the strength of the children of Israel. What sign is this in the sun, moon, and stars? Is this the same sign of Joel 2.10 and Joel 2.31 to start the day of the Lord? No, this is the sign in the sun, moon, and stars in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. This is the third sign in the sun, moon, and stars. This is the one where Jesus comes on the last day. I said third because the fourth trumpet, there's also a sign in the sun, moon, and stars. So sixth seal, fourth trumpet, and this one is the seventh bowl sign in the sun, moon, and stars. Hallelujah. Jesus will come to sit and judge the nations. Verse 17, so you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no alien shall ever pass through her again. You need to know where that's at in other chapters and other books of of Bible prophecy. The last pass-through of Judah that's explained to us in the appointed time of the end passage of Daniel 11, 40 through 45, right here it says, No alien 
right? No Antichrist and his hired razor flying the bee forces will ever pass through her again. Zion. Where else is that mentioned? Zechari- uh, Zechariah 9.8. I don't want to turn there because I think my camera is getting ready to shut off. Zechariah 9.8 talks about this final last days pass through of Judah by the Antichrist. Also, this is real important, you find it also in the last verse of Nahum 1. Nahum 1.15 mentions the final pass-through of Judah. Okay? It's, it's real important that you understand that, because that's one of the things you can use to prove that Nahum 1 is future, in regards to the 70th week. And once you know for sure that Nahum 1 is future and involves the final pass-through of Judah... Spoken of in Joel 3.17 and Zechariah 9.8. Then you look at verse 11 in Nahum 1 and you go, that's the final Antichrist that shall come forth from Nineveh. That's why all of the uh, chapters like uh, Micah 5.5, 5, passages like uh, Isaiah 10.25, Isaiah 10.5, Isaiah 14.25, they all talk about the Assyrian, the final Antichrist being an Assyrian. Well, that's why, because he's going to come forth from Nineveh called Al-Mazil, Iraq. Mosul, just like Al-Baghdadi did as a warning to us. Verse 18, and it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine. Now we're talking about the millennium after the judgment has been done. And it's time to clean up the dead bodies. But this talks about how this is the restoration of Israel after Jesus defeats Yahweh's enemies and adversaries. The mountains shall drip with new wine. The hills shall flow with milk. The land's going to long be desolate, even with Jesus there. He's not going to do the I dream of genie blink. All right, men and the captives of Judah are going to have to clean up this mess. And they're going to have to rebuild the cities. And they're going to build a millennial temple. Maybe where the tribulation temple will be built. But it'll be up there on the Temple Mount. Uh, All the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Acacias. Egypt shall be a desolation. Remember Daniel 9's desolations? Egypt gets hit hard during phase one and phase two. Uh, And Edom, a desolate wilderness, right? Jordan, southern Jordan, because of violence against the people of Judah, for they have shed innocent blood in their land. Uh, Jordan's going to be involved in a lot of the killing and taking captive of Israel. And Jerusalem from generation to generation, but Judah shall abide forever. For I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed whom I have not, had not acquitted, for the Lord dwells in Zion. Right? So he's not going to show them Israel his face during phase one, but phase two he will. Brothers and sisters, I hope you enjoyed this uh, um, verse by verse of Joel 3. Uh, If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section. Uh, Joel 2, Joel 3, we finished it. Uh, If you have any questions, ask. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.